still got his screen shot. My name is Jack. This is going to be... Oh, you, you, can you can tell people to hush up, don't worry. Uh, the mic. Talk, kind of on like how to be more private when you're surfing the web and stuff. So, I'm a fourth year from Long Island. Um, we're actually, if you guys are anyone's interested, running the RIT Skydiving Club. So, if you're interested, we're going to be jumping sometime in the next few days. Um, talk about it. Anything you like this time? So we could, uh, you could join the Discord and ping either me or Colton, shameless plug. Um, yeah, I like enjoy researching uh, security stuff, privacy stuff, and I like IPAs. <laughs> so here's some notes about the presentation. Uh, lots of demos, which might be cut down a little bit because of time, but two-thirds of this is probably going to be just comparing privacy stuff, uh, like services that you could use to more private services. And one third of it is this research project that I did about JavaScript port scanning. And yeah, this isn't supposed to like, you're not supposed to implement everything in this talk, just maybe take one or two things of it. If you implement everything, you'll probably be in the 99 percentile of most private people in, online. So you don't really have to do that because that's overkill. But if you reverse a lot of the stuff I talk about, it could actually be used for OSINT, which is kind of interesting. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of links in the uh, in the speaker notes. Well, what would be privacy talk without some quotes from Eric Edward Snowden? So a few of these I think kind of bring home. So especially with the Steve Jobs one, I resonate a lot with. I believe people are smart, and some people want to share more data than others people do. Ask them, ask them every time. Make them tell you to stop asking them if they get tired of asking. If if they get tired of you asking them. Let them know precisely what data you're gonna, uh, what you're gonna do with their data. So it's kind of just giving the user a choice, um, and that's kind of the model of Apple and how it used to be, still kind of today. But yeah, we keep going. So privacy and security, while they do overlap a lot of the times, they're not the same thing. Um, a good reference is like Google. Google is extremely secure, has hired some of the best security talent in the world. They have two-factor authentication, really strong encryption. They have no real history of data breaches uh, that would embarrass them that much. They have a lot of anomalous detection, a lot of machine learning, a lot of really good stuff. So their security of their network and their data is really well. <clears throat> but the privacy, on the other hand, is not that great. They're on about 70% of websites with Google Analytics tracking you where you go. So that's how something like that can the difference between uh, security and privacy. Um, yeah, privacy is when a company only collects data essential to providing the service desired by the client, and any data that is collected is not being further processed or sold. So that's kind of the idea. All right. All right, this is the last one about like an overview of it, and then we'll get into it. Uh, zero knowledge is an important concept to understand with privacy. It's a type of provider that um, that only can't access your data. So some of the sites and services that you use may have a little note that says like. Even we at, at company can't like see what your texts are or whatnot. That's what a zero knowledge provider is. That's kind of the gold standard of any um, privacy oriented service that you would want to use. So here we go. Uh, web browsers. So web browsers are really important because it's on the endpoint and it can see everything regardless of encryption. So something like Google Chrome doesn't need to you know, do anything fancy to see what you're searching because it's all in plain text to them. So you want to make sure you have a good web browser. Firefox has always been the gold standard. They've had a long history of protecting users' privacy. They are backed by a nonprofit. They have a bunch of uh, enhanced tracking protection. They're open source, independently audited. They're kind of the gold standard for um, just browsing online and not being tracked. Now, Chrome um, open sourced their, a version of their, uh, browser and called it Chromium, and then a lot of privacy-based uh, browsers came from that. Bra uh, Brave, there's Ungoogled, uh, Google Chrome, there's Chromon, there's a bunch of them. So Brave has kind of taken um, a large stake in the, in, the, in the browser game because they have a lot of features, they have a lot of backing, they're Chromium-based, they're also open source, and they have a lot of cool features like if you go to a 404 page, it'll instantly pull up Wayback Machine and say, like, do you want to check? Like, a week ago, was this page here? Uh, it has Tor integrated, which I don't recommend, but it's there. 
Um, it's not really how you're supposed to use Tor, but I mean, I guess it's cool. It blocks ads and trackers by default, and they integrated the interplanetary file system, which really, it's kind of just like torrenting, but I guess that's cool. It's just something they do. Um, yeah, so speaking of Tor, Tor is, uh, Brendan just talked about this a little bit, so I'll go a little quick over this. They anima, and, 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 and I, I can't, whatever. <laughs> they hide your internet traffic. With three hops, they encrypted a new level of encryption at each hop. So the entry node um, would have all three layers of encryption, and it would strip off the first one. And then the second one would strip off the second layer of encryption, and so on and so forth until it's decrypted and sent to the destination. Um, does anyone know what this giant spike is? So this is the daily um, connected users to Tor. And this is uh, from about 2010 to 2021. And that's about 2013 as an entry. Giant spike from about 1 million users to 6 million. When Edward Snowden released all the documents. Right. So that helped the network out a lot. But yeah. So how to use Tor securely. There's a lot of ways to not use Tor correctly. And those are all shown in that DEF CON talk if you guys want to watch it. It's really good. It talks about all the ways people have gotten caught. Um, website fingerprinting as well. I worked a lot with Dr. Wright on that. Um, he has a great paper on how he got 98.3% accuracy on fingerprinting Tor traffic just on the network patterns, not breaking any encryption or anything. So that's really interesting. There's also timing attacks, which the NSA was using. And yeah, so how to use it securely. You're not even supposed to resize the window. So that's important because fingerprinting is a big issue with Tor. Um, well, it's an issue all across the web, but how they do it is every single user is supposed to use it the same exact way without even resizing the window. Um, don't download any add-ons. Don't authenticate. Because if you use Tor and then go authenticate to your Twitter, it kind of defeats the purpose because then you have a linking to your identity. So um, use a VPN is really controversial with it. A lot of people say you shouldn't use a VPN because it's like a permanent uh, entry node. A lot of people say you should use a VPN because it's you know, more is better. But in my thought, I think using a VPN is actually better because it does defeat, it, it obscures your traffic more so that things like website fingerprinting are harder to do because you have to identify the Tor traffic to do website fingerprinting. So it makes it harder if, uh, and it obfuscates your traffic from your ISP and stuff. So. I think it's better, but a lot of people tell me I'm wrong. So. And then the only thing you should adjust is the high, medium, and low security settings. There's a little toggle, depending on what you want. Um, oh, I do have a little bit of a PSA. I don't want to break anything, but let's see if this works. All right. so. Tor has, there's obviously Tor, right? This is the browser. It's just based on Mozilla Firefox. And then there's, um, this is an open source project called Onion Share, which is pretty cool. It allows it to, it has a nice GUI. It's built in Python, so it cross compiles on every OS. And you can do a lot of really like powerful things. You could host a website right now. So um, I actually statically compiled RIT sec since you can only host static uh, websites. And, and you can actually host the website on Tor in a matter of seconds. So here you go. If you guys go to this address and you have Tor, um, I can put it in a URL shortener if anyone's super curious. But in a few seconds, Tor is not the fastest. But So how Onion sites work is actually also pretty interesting. Here you go. Give it a second. It's got to load. And then there's our beautiful faces. Eventually. There you go. So, <laughs> so how Tor Onion sites work is actually a little bit more complicated. You have the three nodes, which we everyone talks about. Then you have a rendezvous point, which kind of looks up the DNS um, to see where you're going. And then you have three more relays, an entire another circuit, and then the onion site. So this creates anonymity from the server to the client. So this prevents 
uh, the common um, tactic of just servers always have to have public IP addresses. In this case, the client doesn't know the server and the server doesn't know the client. So that's the benefit of, that's why darknet and drugs and stuff. And <laughs> whatever. Also, another cool thing about this uh, you, like tool is that you could host a uh, chat server. So in like one second, you could host an entire chat server over Tor, and then you just, you can put this in a URL shortener, but yeah. If anyone goes to this address, they'll be able to uh, just hop on and chat away with everybody else, and it'll be completely anonymous. Cool thing, but yeah, I don't know how much it would be cool. Uh, Um, moving on. DNS. <clears throat> DNS is kind of like the web browser. It kind of knows everything, right? Because in traditional DNS, it's unencrypted, and your DNS server can correlate your IP to what you're looking up, and they can just keep a record of it, right? So you kind of want to have a good DNS server. Don't use Google. They sell your data, but it's fast. If you use your ISP, it's horribly slow, and they sell your data, so that's not good either. And then if you use one of these services over here, this is taken from uh, privacytools.io, it's a great, great site. Um, any one of these is acceptable. I just use Cloudflare, it's easy to remember, 1.1.1.1, and you can't go wrong with that. If they're fast, then they tell you they don't sell your data, so that's nice. <laughs> so these are some common web browser privacy concerns that I can think of. Incognito mode is really deceptive. Google actually got sued over that. I think they had to pay up a lot of money. Um, WebRTC is the thing that's really beneficial right now, allowing you to do things like Microsoft Teams in the browser, um, Slack calls in the browser, things like that. So this protocol is really useful, but it does expose um, internal IP addresses to the internet. So if someone, um, you could access it through JavaScript, which isn't the biggest deal. It doesn't really matter, but just something to keep an eye on. A referrer header spelt wrong because I don't know, like people just never wanted to change it back. Um, so this is a header that tells the website, the previous website you were at. So if you didn't know about this, every website knows the previous website you were just at. And this is uh, really useful in some cases if you wanna get analytics about like, if I run a blog, where are all the people coming to, from, uh, coming to my blog from? You know, you'll find some like chat room or something. Um, but if you don't want to tell everything, you can just disable that with some extensions. IP addresses are automatically logged. If you've ever booted up an Apache server and an Nginx server, get requests, automatically logged. Not the biggest deal in the world, but just to, to uh, keep your eye out. X404 and via IP is um, really bad if your proxy or VPN uses this, because all this does is say, I'm a proxy or VPN and I'm forwarding this request on behalf of this person or this IP address. So it kind of defeats the purpose of even having a proxy or a VPN in the first place. Um, user agent just tells you what device you're using, really useful for formatting things on the page. JavaScript port scanning. So this is, this is something I kind of went down a big rabbit hole with, and you'll see it in a minute, but yeah. Um, it kind of didn't make sense at first to a lot of people, but then it, it, over time. Um, plain text DNS, we already went over that. So if you guys want to do this on your own, I don't know if I have time to do this, but browser leaks, you could do all these little things, and if you just go to these websites, um, it'll fingerprint your whole website and then tell you all the information it's able to collect from it. So, um, like, Intel Techniques Logger is able to tell you if Discord is running on your computer. It's able to, like, uh, find your IPv6 address, which is IPv6 leaks from, like, it can bypass your VPN sometimes. Fingerprinting, but they, it's, it goes super intense, it's, but yeah. So the web, the websites can port scan us is like a really weird concept. It didn't really make sense last May when this became a big topic. There was a few blogs post on it, which didn't gain a lot of traction. And then NordVPN tweeted out that eBay was port scanning people and everyone kind of shit on them for a while because they're like, that doesn't make any sense. You know, because no one really got the concept because they didn't, NordVPN didn't really say JavaScript port scanning. They were just saying like, 
eBay servers for point scanning. It just, it was lost in translation. But yeah, so websites can actually port scan you, which is weird, um, through JavaScript, which makes sense, but it just, no one really ever thought about it. So this is really different from Shodan, because Shodan is kind of like you're port scanning the public internet and, um, you know, things that are publicly available. This is bypassing a lot of security measures and then port scanning your private network. So Shodan's kind of like walking down the street and then like looking at people's houses, maybe knocking on the door, while like port scanning through JavaScript is kind of like throwing a brick through the window and grabbing a beer and watching this like football game, you know? It's kind of like just really invasive because if you have a firewall, if you have antivirus, if you have even like extensions like uBlock Origin, a pinehole, IDS, all security measures won't stop this. And no one really has a good solution. Like every single article about this was, you can't really do anything about it. Um, yeah, in some cases they can de-anonymize your VPN. So I didn't mean to do that, but yeah. So down here, you can notice two things. The first thing is that it port scans you. It port scans like 10 or 12. And then around it, you, can, you can't see it because the thing's there, but we'll get into that. That's fine. So yeah, this is just going back to like, how can we stop this? Um, these are the proposed solutions from all the articles that I read. You block origin, you can block the domain that pulls down the script that port scans you. Really makeshift the approach. Um, you can block all WebSockets, because some of them use WebSockets, not all of them. Some of them use HTTP and HTTPS. Um, and that kind of breaks a lot of stuff. Blocking an entire protocol isn't really a good defense tactic. Using Tor blocks it, but like, who wants to use Tor for your normal browser? And then Brave seems to block it because it blocks the domain of certain ones. But while all these solutions solve the specific instance of browser-based port scanning temporarily, it's kind of like playing whack-a-mole. As soon as one changes their domain name, it's useless. So you'll never actually block all of them. So I actually wrote a um, browser extension called Port Authority for Firefox. And it, here, I'll show you. It blocks port scanning pretty much, right? So what it does is I have a really nasty regex that looks for every case of internal IP addresses. So over HTTP, HTTPS, WebSockets, Web Secure Sockets, even FTP. Um, and I'll show you, it's easier to show. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. So this is the this is the plugin, right? And I have it installed right now. And if we go to HTTP port scanning, we try and port scan our computer. I'll pull up the network tab. So it'll block it, right? And I could also port, port scan the entire um, 255 class C um, network. And you'll see up there, there's a little counter that tells you how many it's blocked. You get a little alert when a website tries to port scan you. So this is cool. This is HTTP and HTTPS. Um, and then here's a good article. There, there's a good article on Medium. And this person wrote this website. You can see uh, up here, uh, Port Authority has blocked the site from port scanning you. And you can see the counter is going crazy. So this tries to port scan you and um, and retrieve if, if you're a node developer. This person points out like malicious uses of port scanning. If you're a node developer, you can connect to the local host instance, instance of it. And then this website is a proof of concept that will actually pull down your whole project and like show it to you and all that good stuff. So if you're curious, this is actually the regex that I, yeah, it's, you don't understand. Oh my god. Yeah, this is the whole regex that I wrote for this specific instance. And what it does is down here it makes more sense. It blocks things, it, it blocks local host, it blocks uh, different casing of local host, web sockets, FTP, class A addresses, B, C, IPv6, 
Um, it even goes down to like link local IPv4. And so it blocks everything, right? So the premise of how this works is it checks the website that you're on, so like up here, and it says, is that a local IP address? And if it's not, and it tries to reach out to a local IP address, it blocks it. Very simple. Um, it, it took a lot longer than that, but <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's how you test it. It's open source. Um, oh, so back, okay, we'll stay here. So at the bottom, you can see that on, on Chick-fil-A, which is the website we were previously using, right? Um, it reaches out to this domain, tmetrics.my.chickfilae.com, right? So you're like, okay, well, it's Chick-fil-A's metrics server that they're running. Turns out it's not. When you check, uh, when you do a dig on it, the C name comes back as h-chickfilae.online-metrics.net, which is owned by Threat Metrics, which is a company owned by LexisNexis, which is one of the biggest data brokers in the world. So why would they set up a specific endpoint for this client, right? Uh, for Chick-fil-A in this instance. It's because they don't want you to block onlinemetrics.net and then just throw in an asterisk and call it a day. They want to make it really, really difficult um, because there's no C name that goes from H Chick-fil-A back to the customer specific endpoint. So you would have to find every customer specific endpoint, put it in a list, and then block it, which is really tedious. Um, yeah, so this is what they collect. Um, I actually have a list of all the data that they collect. Uh, I think it's 400, 416 data points that, col that script collects. And some of it is what they call true IP, where they try and de-anonymize your VPN. Um, down here, true location behavior analysis detects a cloaking of or IP spoofing proxies. Down there it says Tor and other stuff. Uh, this guy, Dan Nemec, actually did a great reverse engineer of this script back when it was relevant with eBay. Um, this is how a lot of people learned about this and how it was like really messed up. Because these are the things the script does. So first of all, it uses a customer specific endpoint that's really hard to block and then redirects to its infrastructure. The data being exfilled is encrypted into an image with XOR. The JavaScript is assembled via string.join and then put into a service worker. Each time you load the page, the JavaScript is re-obfuscated and it collects all this ridiculous amount of information. I can pull it up if, if we'll just keep going. So my first thought was like, how do I find all the endpoints of their infrastructure? Um, Asset Finder is a really cool tool. It's written in Go by this guy named Tom Nom Nom, who's a bug bounty guy, and it's pretty much black magic. If you just give it a domain, this is good for pen tests, this is good for literally anything. If you just give it a domain, it'll tell you all the subdomains. I don't know where it queries, but it is by far the best results I've ever gotten. So I got back 100, uh, 600 unique results for clients. So these are all clients. You can see, uh, what's some good ones? Car gurus, literally everybody. There's Chick Fil A down there. There's Chegg, Chase Bank. This is this is propagated all over the internet. Um, yeah, so we can't block these. This is kind of useless to us because if you block these, these are just the back end where the customer specific endpoints are redirected to. So you wouldn't ever actually be connecting directly to these. So that's what they did to make it really hard. So you're hungry. You this is like a breakdown of the whole thing. You go to my Chick-fil-A, but you guys could do this right now. If you go into Chick-fil-A and then go into log in, open up the network console, you'll see it. It'll port scan your whole computer. Um, it hits this customer specific endpoint, redirects to their infrastructure, pulls down the script, port scans you, shreds the data, encrypts it, XOR, blah, blah, blah. So I actually wrote a showdown script which in six lines will get every single publicly available client endpoint and then print it out for you. So you could actually just throw all of these into a uh, uBlock origin or something, and these are all the customer specific endpoints that would uh, pop up, right? But this is still kind of like whack-a-mole. 
right? So there's 710, but if you keep running the script in a loop, you'll constantly find a little bit more. Um, so all this does is look for all of these. I, I'd sign, I created a signature because the organization was threat metrics. It's on port 443, and in the HTML, when you try and go to these websites, it'll just say bad request. So with those three, three pieces of information, um, I'm able to find all of them. And then I just check the C name of the SSL certificate. And then you could get all this stuff. So now, since I have the customer specific endpoints, I can check if they're legit. Because you don't want to block things that are uh, you know, going to things if there's a false positive. So this little bit of bash, um, it checks the C name using dig. And then it'll just print it all out. So all of these were true positives, as you can see. There's Chick-fil-A, Citibank, Chase, Chegg. Um, down at the bottom is Disney. There's a ton. There's literally every company that's large enough pays these people. So instead of doing that, I had Port Authority also now check. Every time you make a request, it checks if it's port scanning you. And then it also checks if it's redirecting to threat metrics infrastructure. So you don't have to worry about blocking all those things because it's still playing whack-a-mole. This will block every single instance of, uh, of this um, script being pulled down. So if you just install the add-on, it'll never pull down any of the scripts and you can never be port scanned until someone finds out a way to get around it. <laughs> um, all right, leaving that topic, that's a whole rabbit hole I went down for like a week, but um, browser extensions. So if you're running on Mozilla, I'm pretty sure all of these are on uh, Chrome, but yeah. Clean URLs is good. They, uh, they take all the URLs that um, your browser tries to uh, reach out to and they check for any like tracking um, get parameters or anything, cleans that off. Cookie auto delete co deletes cookies from your computer that are, once you close a tab, it gives like a timer like a 10 second timer, you could adjust it. And uh, if you don't reopen the tab in that amount of time, it'll just delete the cookies so that there's nothing um, like following you or whatnot. Cookie quick manager is more of like a utility. It doesn't really help with privacy, but you can like edit cookies and it's really nice. E-tag Stapa is, uh, E-tags have been known to like track people throughout the, the web. Pretty sure e-tag is like a, a hash of a file to make sure that you have it on your computer. But somehow, there's like a bunch of research out there where it could be used to track you. And I went to the next one. Chameleon's like a Swiss Army knife. Shodan's not really a privacy thing. And Google search link fix is a, uh, when you go on Google and you click on a result, it actually doesn't go to the result. It goes to a Google endpoint that has a redirector to your result. So this just, fixes it so it does what you expect it to do. History cleaner, cleans our history, pretty self-explanatory, so you can give it like three days. It'll only keep your history for three days or whatever. Privacy.com, we'll get into in a minute. Privacy redirects, redirects you like social media stuff to like privacy versions of it. Uh, Multi-account multi containers is a really cool add-on built by Firefox. So you're able to des uh, designate containers for websites. So if you have like a shopping container, all of your websites that you do your shopping, like Amazon and everything, you can put in there so that the, all of their cookies are in the same place and all of their web data is in the same place so they can't reach out to other things. So this is good if you have like a bank account, you can have a container for your banking site so that no other websites or JavaScript or anything can touch it. Um, decentralize uh, loads remote content, like JavaScript uh, stuff and packages locally instead of reaching out to CDNs. Uh, HTTPS everywhere, I'm pretty sure everyone's heard of. Literally just upgrades your HTTP um, connection to an HTTPS one. Yeah, it's made by the EFF. Canvas blocker tries to stop website fingerprinting, but that's pretty much impossible to stop. Privacy policy, TLDR. It, no one reads privacy policies, so this thing will pop up a little like score, like an A, B, C, or D next to each domain you visit that um, the community graded. So there'll be a bunch of nerds that go through the entire policy 
and then they'll pick out things that they don't do or don't like, and then they'll give it an average score. So if you go to like Google, I think it has an F. Um, and then it'll tell you why, which is kind of cool. But yeah. Blockers. There's like Adblock Plus and some other ones, but the stand like the gold standard is uBlock Origin. It's actually not an ad blocker, it doesn't claim to be. It's actually just a generic blocker, but it has lists where you can block ads. Um, really efficient, really well done, big community behind it, uh, free and open source. And yeah, Privacy Badger is built by the EFF, and Privacy Badger does a little bit different. So they actually don't have a static list. They will dynamically look at what each website is trying to do, and then build the list off that. So it'll give like the website a chance, and then if it sees that it's trying to track you, it'll block it and add it to the list. Password managers. So Bitwarden is my favorite. It's secure and super easy to use. Um, it's free too, which is super nice. Or if you want the paid plan, it's only $10 a year. So I think that's really reasonable. It's free and open source. Um, it's been independently audited, I think a few times. Uh, it has a lot of pretty much every bell and whistle you could expect from it. TPass XE is for like super hardcore privacy people that just don't want, I don't know, tinfoil hatty kind of thing. It's offline and um, yeah, it, it's just it's just offline, super secure, but it's not really useful in today's day and age, in my opinion. Because if you need a password on your phone, there's ways to sync it, but it's just whatever. One password, really popular, really secure, really good. Integrated with privacy.com, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, secure, super easy. It's a little bit more money. It's $36 a year, so it's like three times the cost of Bitwarden. It's also closed source, if you care about that. LessPass is really weird. It's a password manager, but it's like publicly available, kind of. Um, let's see. Uh, we'll just go here. So if you go to lastpass.com, so you put in the site, right? So let's say google.com, you put in login, so Jack, and then my master password is Jack, okay? Nice, secure. <laughs> It'll give you a random password. So it's kind of like a hash where those three pieces of information will always give you the same password. So it's a, called a stateless password manager where you don't you can access it anywhere and you don't have to like keep a file. I don't know, it's kind of weird, but it, apparently it's super secure. So if I make this like really long, it'll give me a different one. But if I regenerate it, it'll always give me the same one. Kind of weird, but also kind of cool. Okay, gotta breeze through these. Two-factor auth. There's physical, software token, and non-dedicated. So these are just other things. Physical, YubiKey, only key, physical devices, software token, you got Authy, closed source, Tofu, and Authenticator, which are both open source solutions. Um, yeah, 2FA, it's really good, you should use it. Uh, I don't know if we'll get into this, but you can actually, if you don't trust an add-on, um, you can actually reverse engineer using this Python tool, which is super cool. Um, some things you want to check is open source permissions, what are the reviews saying and whatnot. This you just this tool, you just give here. Actually, let's it'll take three seconds. All right. Well, maybe we won't. Okay. Well, it has a giant, so you just give it the URL of the extension on either Chrome or Firefox. It will pull it down, reverse engineer the whole thing, and give you a nice web UI for it. Um, this is a way to fuck with advertisers. If you go to this link, uh, trackthis.link, this is built by Mozilla. And what it does is um, it opens up a hundred tabs of whatever you choose. So you could choose Hype Beast, Filthy Rich, Doomsday, or Influencer, and it would open up a hundred tabs related to that, hoping that all the advertisers and everything will now see all of that data and now think you're either a Hype Beast or a Doomsday Prepper and you'll get ads relevant to that. It's kind of just funny. All analytics, not bad. Let's get through this a little bit, but yeah, there's some good solutions like 
Matomo, which you'll learn about in like web app security if anyone ever takes it. It's a really good course. Fathom Analytics, Plausible.io, stuff like that. There's good solutions out there. Search engines. The two big competitors right now are like DuckDuckGo, which is US based, has a lot of cool features, um, privacy oriented, and StarPage. StarPage is interesting because a lot of people don't like DuckDuckGo because of the results that they get, right? Because DuckDuckGo does their own scraping. They scrape from like 400 sources, but they also do their own, which isn't as good because they don't track users as much, so they can't, you know, get the best results. StartPage is a privacy oriented um, search engine, but they actually query Google. So they pay for Google's API and then give you the results. So if you want Google results but not Google, use StartPage. DuckDuckGo has a onion link, so you could use it on tour. You could also do these cool bang things. So if you do like um, exclamation point S, anything you type will be searched in StartPage. Exclamation point G will be searched on Google, things like that. Um, yeah, DuckDuckGo is unbiased results, and then start page by association is biased because it's Google. Um, anonymous view, good stuff. Closer media, there's things called progressive web apps, which I just learned about from researching this thing. Um, you can actually, you remember the add to home feature that everyone used in like 2010 to like bookmark things? Now when you do it, it actually bookmarks a full-blown app that you can use. This is a test account I put in, but yeah. So it gives you a full app that has all the functionality of a normal one. Um, I think it's more private. It Also, you don't get any ads, which is kind of nice. If you use, um, Twitter has one, which you're seeing here. So it's actually not even installed on the device. It's just using the website and yeah. So Twitter has one, Instagram has one, um, YouTube, you can get a variation of it, and you don't really get any ads, so it's kind of nice, but yeah. Uh, this is just some guy on Twitter made this. Um, as soon as Apple created all these privacy-related um, analytics and stuff that they put on iOS 14, he just compared all of them. Email providers, pretty important. There's ProtonMail and Tutanota which are the two big ones. They both have encrypted inboxes. Um, you can turn off personalization and Gmail, make it a little bit better, but uh, those two are kind of the standard. This is another, the same guy, put all this stuff for the web, uh, for the email clients on iOS. Temporary email, if you haven't heard about this, it's really, really useful, not for privacy stuff, just daily use. If you have to put in your email address to, uh, to get a file or whatnot, you just throw in a 10 minute mail address and then you get the email and then it's burned. So you just don't have to worry about junk or anything. If you want a more long-term solution, there's email forwarders like 33mail, Anonati, Simple Login, uh, Sign In with Apple does this as well. They give a forwarding address, which then goes to your real inbox and it will always go to your real inbox, but um, the user, so if you're, if the website gets in a data breach or whatever, no one will know that it goes to real inbox in this scenario. Also with Gmail, if you don't know, there's a trick where if you put in your RIT email address and then do a plus, you can specify, so my RIT email, let's just say it's jack at rit.edu. If I do jack plus um, twitter at rit.edu, or yeah, it will go to my inbox under that, like, specific tag so that you can kind of organize like your websites. You can do the same thing with dots. So if you want to make multiple accounts on the same site, if they don't filter by pluses and dots, you can do this trick and make a bunch of accounts. Um, Privacy.com is super cool. Uh, you can make free virtual debit cards and make unlimited of them. It's kind of like the best thing for privacy because you don't have to put in any real billing information when you make a purchase, and you could hide all your transactions from your bank too. So if you wanted to, you do this. Um, cards are also locked at the first merchant that it's used, so if the card gets in a breach or something, it can't be used anywhere else. You can put limits on it, a bunch of other stuff. So this is kind of how it works. Here's your bank, here's privacy.com. You link privacy.com to your debit card, uh, your, your checking account, 
they follow all KYC laws. So it's all legal because if if you you're not completely anonymous by any means, right? Like if the government says you did this bad thing and you bought this thing that you shouldn't have bought, they can go to privacy.com and they have the um, they have to keep all transactions for seven years. But what it does do is allow um, you to mask what your bank sees if you're into that. And these are the options it gives. It actually gives NSA gift shop as one of them. And you could also mask all your billing information from any potential website you sign up for. Or if you're going to a sketchy website and you don't know if it's going to steal your stuff, you can just make one of these cards, put a $1 limit on it, which is also really good for um, if you want to sign up for trials. You can use this, put a $1 limit on it, and then you can close the card. And then it'll keep, it'll bounce. So it, it just never hits your bank account, actually. So that's a good use for it. Secure communications, there's Signal, which is recommended by Elon Musk. Uh, Session, which is a fork of Signal, which doesn't have to use your, um, which doesn't have to use a phone number. Jitsi and Matrix and all these other ones. Signal's by far the best just because it has a large user base. It's an SMS alternative is how it claims to be. They built the Signal protocol. Uh, here's just the metadata of all the popular services and then signal. Um, here's some examples of just different privacy related messaging services. Temp phone numbers. If you want to burn a number, you could actually buy a 99 cent SIM card from Mint Mobile on Amazon and it'll give you a week trial. So a lot of VoIP numbers get blocked by services, but if you want, if you really want to, uh, like get a legit SIM card and everything that can't be blocked. You just 99 cents, you get one. Uh, this is another demo, I think I'm gonna skip, but if you go to this website, you could actually look up a lot of information about phone numbers. Um, the demo was looking up Mark Cuban's phone number. But, okay. File transfers, onion share is what I was showing before, you could use that to file share. Magic wormhole is another thing, it's more uh, CLI based but it uses Tor. GoFile, Treasurit, and Swiss Transfer are really good services that just allow you to transfer files securely. Local encryption, there's Veracrypt, which is kind of like what everyone uses. You can make containers. Uh, you'll do an auth lab with that. BitLocker, which is proprietary, built by Windows. And then there's a bunch of good new stuff. Uh, and then there's hat.sh, which is a website that can encrypt files with on your local machine just using JavaScript, which is super easy for just doing it on the fly. Encrypted cloud backups, a bunch of good services here. Um, iCloud actually doesn't, um, they're not a zero knowledge provider. Down here you can see if you have an iCloud backup turned on, your backup includes a copy of the key protecting your messages. So if you have your messages backed up to iCloud, they're not, encrypted in a sense, like they're end-to-end -end encrypted until you put them on the cloud because then Apple keeps a copy of the key. So it kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, yeah. Oh, down here, unlimited free encrypted cloud storage. There, there still is this trick where on Google Drive, there is zero, if you create a Google Doc, it counts towards zero bytes of your total file storage, right? So what people figured out is if you just create a program that can split up files, encrypt them in, or encode them into images, and then split it up and upload it to Google Drive, you could get unlimited um, file storage, which is pretty cool. It's still working right now, but Google in 2022 is gonna start making Google Docs count towards your quota. So it's kind of, I think they abandoned the project because of that information. Data is really powerful, obviously. Um, here's some websites where if you go to like simpleoptout.com, you can see all the websites and then you click on one, it shows you what data they store and how to opt out of it. We'll just keep going. You can turn off all your stuff on Google. VPNs, um, if you're into that. Molved, so these are the three that are kind of the standard for um, privacy. There's iVPN, Proton, and Molved. They're each pretty, Portable. They have pill switches. They're outside of five, nine, and fourteen eyes. All that good stuff. 
data breaches are fun. Um, there's a lot of public forums online, which are not hard at all to find, that post all this data for free, billions and billions of accounts. Facebook just got popped, or, well, they got leaked. They had a leak a long time ago, which just got posted publicly, um, which affected half a billion users. So there's constantly data all the time that's coming out about this stuff. Cilia.so is a kind of borderline ethical site which queries all this data. It collects all of it, indexes all of it, and then puts it up for free for anybody to search. It's kind of like Have I Been Pwned, but it shows you the data. So, yeah. It's down right now, but there it'll be up in, apparently. This one's for um, Boom. physical Yay. security interests. Or put this in just for him. <laughs> Mobile browsers. Safari is fine, but you can use Firefox or DuckDuckGo. Android, same thing. Uh, just another comparison. Uh, this is another comparison of market share versus like the data that they collect. Mobile blockers. AdGuard is actually really good for iOS. It'll block a lot of the analytics and stuff, and it'll block a lot of ads and good stuff. Uh, here's a bunch of iOS stuff. Um, yeah, it's just a lot of stuff. OS, <laughs> Linux is the best for um, just privacy in general. If you're going on Windows, here's some programs that will actually limit the amount that Windows tracks from you. Um, PeachBlit and CCleaner are good. Here's two Windows security tips that I know. I don't know a lot about Windows security, but I know these two. This one stops Mimicats by um, protecting dumping of L LSAS, which is kind of useful. And this one protects UAZ. So if you have like biometrics on your Windows laptop, every time you try and do um, something with UAC, it'll just ask for you to authenticate, which is super simple, but it stops like rubber duckies and stuff. And that's it. These are some resources. And yeah.